Welcome everyone, and thank you for joining us for this panel, uh, which is on sources, citation, and fact checking. And I am the chair of the panel. My name is Abe McMaster. I'm gonna start by acknowledging that I am on Robertson-Huron Treaty territory and in the traditional territory of the Atikamekshing, Anishinaabeg, and Wanapate. Uh, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start by a brief introduction of our panelists, and then I'm going to turn to them and ask them each to give a really brief, um, add anything that I missed in the introduction that they wanted, and then a brief uh, outline of how they deal with sources and citation in their own podcasts at the moment. Uh, I have a few questions to ask after that, and then I will uh, open it up for questions and general discussion. And please feel free to put questions and discussion points in the chat the whole way through. I'm also going to post in the chat, uh, we've made a Google Doc, which is open to editing for anyone who would like to access it. It currently has contact information for the panelists and useful resources that we thought you might want to look at. Uh, I will attempt to take some notes if I think anything in particular that has been said can help us work towards sort of the best practices or thoughts about, you know, if someone shares something that we think is useful, I will take some notes on the podcast. Uh, I'm fine if other people want to add to that as well. It, you know, it's a collaborative document, feel free now or later. Um, and I hope, and I'll post it in the chat a few times during the term, the, um, session, since I know that if you join late, you don't see the chat from earlier, uh, but that might be useful for people. And I've also left a section at the bottom where audience members, if you would like to put your own contact info in, um, if you want to continue this discussion later, or if it's just a way of um, saying hello to some other people that you wanted to get to know, uh, feel free to do that as well, whether it's Twitter handles or emails or your podcast information, that's fine. So that's accessible there. All right. So let me just start by uh, introducing our three panelists. So today we have, uh, the first is Donna Langil, is the uh, Community Engagement and Open Education Librarian at the University of British Columbia, Okanagan. Uh, she is also the subject librarian for the digital, uh, sorry, on lo Okanagan, located on the unceded territory of the Siak on Okanagan peoples. She's also the subject librarian for the digital humanities, film studies, theater, and media studies. Prior to becoming a librarian, she obtained, obtained a diploma in film production, which is where she developed her interest and skills in audio editing and storytelling. She's also currently working on her own research creation project, a podcast called Okanagan Queer Story. This interview podcast seeks to highlight the untold stories of the queer history of the Okanagan. So welcome, Donna. Uh, our next panelist is Tala Asan. Uh, Tala Asan is the founder, host, and producer of the Abbasid History Podcast. Their mission is to be the premier platform for pre-modern history through Islam. <laughs> There's a lot of slashes in this uh, written version I have, but Islamicate or Islamic sources. He is currently a PhD student in medieval history at the School of Oriental and African Studies in London. And finally, our third panelist is Mark Sunderham. Mark Sunderham is the co-host of the Endless Knot podcast about language and history and unexpected connections. He also creates YouTube videos about etymology and history at the Alliterative YouTube channel. His PhD is in medieval studies, and he teaches the history of English at Laurentian University. And I should say, as full disclosure, uh, I am also the co-host of the Endless Knot podcast, and Mark and I are married. So that is the panel. So what I'm going to ask is for each of you to, uh, we'll, we'll go in the same order, and I'll ask you to just give me a couple of words about your current citation practices on your podcast, and or what you would like to be able to do if you had the resources to do it, because those may not be the same thing. And I think that's one of the things we need to talk about. So Donna, if you would like to begin. Thank you for the introduction. Um, so my podcast is a conversational podcast between me and usually just one other person. And uh, we've only released two episodes so far and we haven't included any sources or citations yet. Um, I usually ask people to recall significant moments in their lives um, or, uh, or moments in the city's history. Um, and these moments have been written about in newspapers or online blogs. So it's possible that we could provide a bit more context, um, possibly in the form of, short, of a bibliography or in our show notes. 
Um, but we have chosen not to, uh, mainly for two reasons at this moment. So um, a lack of capacity and time. I'm currently the only person who is producing the, the, the podcast. Um, and uh, yeah, it's just been hard to kind of get, get those resources together. Um, but then the other reason is that the point of our podcast has always been to amplify voices within our own community. And we live in a historically conservative city um, where people within the LGBTQIA plus community haven't been reflected very well in the mainstream media. Um, so so I'm, I'm a little bit reluctant at this stage to, to include um, some of those, those newspaper articles or, or blog posts or um, you know, secondary sources. Um, but one thing that we do in the podcast is, is we don't just talk about the moments and uh, memories that these folks have, but we also talk about why it's important to record um, and preserve them. So that's kind of the emphasis right now. Great, thank you. Uh, Tala, would you like to tell us about yours? Sure, can you hear me? Okay, so um, the way our website works, it's interviews with um, an academic um, on a specific topic that they specialize in. We send the questions in advance. Um, the format is usually um, a focus on a person because you find it's, it's easier to talk about abstract ideas through biographies of people. So we usually, the first question is, the social political context, then something about the person, their biography, uh, then about their works, and about the legacy of their works today. And the, the final question is the opportunity for the guest to promote something. Um, so we also have transcripts, which is done by a uh, pod scribe. We, we outsource that to them and that's, that's all, uh, automated. And it requires to be edited because they're using a f lots of, of foreign language terms. And so they don't always come out. In terms of um, Pacific citations, so, so the issues that for me is this. I want these podcasts to be used as resources almost almost like um audio articles right? we have audio books but these are audio articles because often the guests are simply um reading from the articles or reading from their books so and and these podcasts ha have been put on college reading lists and so for me the intention is that for an undergraduate who's unfamiliar with the topic, then to hear it in a, in a period of like half an hour, it's easier to absorb that information quickly. So when they go to the reading, they hit the ground running. If someone wanted to cite this podcast, I don't know if there's a standard out there now, like for citing podcasts or even tweets or TikTok or anything like that. I mean, I think there might be, I've, I've, I might've seen something for Twitter at least as a way of citing them. I don't know whether that works for podcasts. And so the issue is then how would someone cite um, a, a podcast, right? That's just one issue. Um, in terms of our notes, so what we do is, um, what we'd like to do going forward is to give uh, the sources that the guest has referred to usually sort of in a format of something that's very easy, something that's very advanced and something which is a primary source as well, like five things. That's, that's currently what I have to say, I think, to start off with. Great, thank you. Yeah, we'll come back to that question of, of citing podcasts. I think that's an important one and I, I do wanna to get to that. And I think Donna might have some suggestions there, I'm not sure, but we can talk about uh, you know, what are the practices at the moment in those terms? All right, Mark, would you like to talk about ours? Yes. Well, I mean, in the first instance, it's, it's an audio medium. So um, like really key sources, we mention by name um, 
actually in the podcast. And then any any um, any source that we have mentioned by name then gets collated and put in um, the show notes uh, along with um, a, a relevant link if there is one. Um, and but I mean you know, not everything gets cited. So if I mention, you know, the etymology of a word, I don't, you know, specifically call out the, you know, half dozen resource books that that I looked things up in, you know, half dozen dictionaries or whatever. Um, so, you know, it's, I guess our practice is to, to cite the really sort of um, non-obvious sort of key um, uh, sources. And, uh, you know, we're kind of a bit torn in this because we also, since we do videos on YouTube, um, it's a kind of a different mechanism to handle um, stuff like that. Uh, I mean, you do have a, a sort of description below the video. It's limited in space. So, uh, you know, you can't really use it to cite every single time you draw a resource, uh, that would be presumably quite quite a bit too long. Um, but we put a link to a, a static web page that has uh, the um, all the bibliography uh, of anything that we've used, not cited sort of instance by instance, but at least a bibliography of every resource we've used. Um, and even there, you know, we don't list you know, as I say, for things like dictionaries and, and looking up etymologies and stuff like that, we have a sort of master list of here are all the dictionaries that I regularly consult. Um, and but I don't, you know, kind of itemize it for each each time. Um, you can just sort of be assured that I every every etymology I will look up in multiple sources. And uh, if there's discrepancy uh, between what, what different etymologists think, and I will, you know, kind of deal with that as necessary. So it, it's a question of balancing for us uh, the wanting to get the uh, the citations in there so that the work is reliable and people can fact check if they want and and so forth. Um, and yet, you know, there's a bit of a trade off with the amount of time it would take and the, the sort of technical limitations of like citing every instance uh, where an idea might come from a certain source. So I guess that's our balance. Thanks, yeah. Um, just to add to that, I mean, it also is partly because our podcast is, you know, usually at least an hour long, uh, generally conversational. We do, when we do interviews, it's a little more straightforward. You're if you're interviewing somebody who's had a book or or something, then you 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 cite that, and it's pretty it's pretty simple. But when it's us talking about the history of pets in the ancient world, we're maybe going to have drawn on a whole bunch of things, and we don't footnote right. And I think this is one of the thing, the tensions that as academics we have a tendency to feel like not only should you give the sources you've used, but you should be highlighting each source for each fact. I mean, that's what I'd be doing if I was writing certain kinds of articles anyway. But of course, it's not what you do when you write other kinds. So, you know, again, like, as you say, that tension of been how, how detailed do you need to be? And I think that brings us to, I think, what needs to be the guiding question for this conversation, um, which is what is the purpose of citations in a podcast? What, why, you know, why have citations why have sources? What are they? And, and if we think about it from two perspectives, from the podcaster's perspective, what, you know, what do you want to signal? And what is the purpose of you giving citations? And Donna, you've addressed that, for instance, in, in, in that you don't want to necessarily signal that um, a conservative media's report on a, uh, an an a place important in queer history is the fact of record on that, that Place, right? You don't, that's, you want to intentionally decenter that narrative. And so you don't want to cite that narrative. Um, whereas, uh, you know, Tala, you're talking about wanting it to be useful for students and therefore as a jumping off point, there's a, there's a different usefulness there. So what is the purpose that a podcaster might have for citing and what are the best ways to do that? But also when someone comes to a podcast, 
why would they, you know, when we, when we cite, where as academics, when we write scholarship, we use citations for a number of reasons, but one of the main ones is theoretically at least, so that people can um, trace back our research, take, it, take that step back, see where we got what we got from and decide if they came to the same conclusions or not. Uh, I actually question how much that actually happens in scholarship, but nonetheless, that is our stated purpose uh, among others. Is that what a podcast listener coming to a podcast wants to, to do? Is that, is that what they wanna do? Um, what are their reasons for potentially wanting sources? And then I think the other half of that is what might a podcast listener want to do in order to cite your podcast? And that's what you brought up, Tella. If a podcast listener has a desire to cite your podcast, under what circumstances would they want to do? What information would they need to have? What do you need to provide as a podcaster so that someone can cite your podcast in a useful way? And is that a scholarly citation that they're going to want? Is it a link on the internet? You know, like there's a lot of different citational practices on the internet. So those are some of the, the, the main questions. So maybe I'll, I'll ask the panel first, um, does anything strike you as, you know, what is the main reason for, beyond what you've already, you've already said, um, for citing sources and, and how have you, for instance, used other podcast sources or have you ever? I'll, I'll start by opening that, if I may, to the floor. Um, but if nobody speaks, I'll. Yeah, I, I can I can jump in. I think, you know, you've already touched on one, which is, uh, you know, allowing people to uh, to find the sources that you've used. And um, I think what's important there is the format of the citation as well. And um, I'm going to put my librarian hat on just for a minute, I think. Um, I don't I don't think style is so important. And, you know, we see in MLA and APA in Chicago now, we all have examples of how to cite podcasts. So that format is there. Um, but if the intention of the podcast is to speak to a larger audience, you know, outside of academia to reach a wider public, then I'm not convinced that the style of the, of the citation is important. What is is the information that we include that makes it findable. And I think there's a couple um, uh, aspects of the citation, like the title, the author, the format, and the location, at the very least having those available um, to folks um, so that if they do want to find that citation, that they're able to. Um, and I think citation is, is only effective if it's usable by others. Um, um, so, so what does that mean when we're using it in an audio format and, and different types of audio, uh, like whether it's conversational or scripted or, or multiple speakers? Um, I think there's a couple options that are available to us and I'm not sure I know which one is the best yet, um, but you know, some folks have said that they've included detailed citations in their, their show notes or their transcripts. I've also seen um, other podcasts that have used auditory clues. So when they're speaking, they'll, um, insert a sound effect or a ding that will um, tell the audience that they can go and refer to that moment in the transcript to find the full citation. Um, or of course, like Marcus said, like verbal acknowledgement that you're using someone else's ideas. Um, so yeah, just to emphasize that okay. if we are including citations, we're, we're formatting them in a way that allows other people to use them and to find them. I think that's a, a really good point. Sorry, go ahead, Tal. Uh, yeah, so I just want to pick up on that, um, j j just to on how um, podcasts specifically can be cited. Uh, I think as Donna pointed out correctly, it's going to take pretty much the format of how we cite the in, in, in websites, which is I think it's, that's been standardised. The only thing um, I fear is that because the, the nature of digital media changes so rapidly, I don't know how, whether the, the current format of how we have podcasts, you have whatever, you obviously have the, the MP3, you have the show note, you have um, the, the URL or whatever, and R, RSS, and whatever, right? I don't know whether, like in ten years' time, those things will become redundant, um, 
remember the, remember those things called CD-ROMs in the 90s that you could that had encyclopedias and stuff on them. Like if someone cited from those from an article in the 90s, I don't think anyone could ever find them again, right? So I think that's something that's to, to bear in mind. How how can we how can we just talking to donors and like how can we archive podcasts in such a way that they have a longevity in in citation? Right, like, do we put them up on something equivalent to like Internet Archive, so there's like some kind of stability going forward for whatever hundreds of years, right? Because obviously books have that stability, right, in terms of how they're cited, right? So that that's one issue. It's it's, it's uh, ha- citation practice in, in an age of sort of rapidly changing media. Um, in terms of how we cite other people while we do the podcast. I think Mark brought up a good point regarding the show notes. I mean, show, show notes are a key part of what a podcast is. So it's like an integral part of it, right? Like, I don't know, um, whatever, in, 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 in whatever. So, 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 I mean, normally um, those would be sort of the space where you would like put, um, maybe you could put a timestamp if, if required, um, and then sort of mention the article or the book and the page number. Um, but it can just become a bit cumbersome. I think to, 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 it's impractical and it's just bad um, audio, just to bad content, just to keep citing during a con- like uh, an, an audio production. I think that sounds awful. Like look up whatever so and so and so and so book in so and so page. Um, so th- those are my those are some, some thoughts that you know, on the sort of practice of citations and podcasts. Yeah, I think I mean I think that's one of the things we wrestle with absolutely is that you can't you also have to make something that's enjoyable, and I think that comes back to the question of what is the purpose of citation and sources in a podcast, and also what is the point of a you know what is your purpose of your podcast. Mm. If you are very specifically tying a podcast, for instance, to a course you're making, okay, maybe then you have a very, you know, a specific need to cite, this is in the textbook here, and this is, you know, these are in the, our readings that we're doing for, for this subject. Maybe that makes sense. But for most of us, if we also want our podcast to be available and interesting to a general public beyond an academic public, which I think, you know, most people do, uh, there is nothing that is going to put someone off more than hearing, you know, as quoted in, uh, as so-and-so says with every other line. However, that also brings us to another way of thinking about citations and sources. Uh, and of course, again, as I said, this really depends on the kind of podcast you're doing. Um, if you're doing a narrative history, you might be able to just lay out like in your show notes, here are the four books that, and you know, that I consulted for this work. Fine. If you're doing a, an interview podcast, you, you maybe don't need to cite sources at all, or, or you only need to give some very basic ones. If you're doing, um, like the ones we do, our, our whole shtick is interconnections of many little facts. And as Mark says, if we cited every single source for every single thing, he, you know, he, he's trying to do a 45 minute connections between uh, a whole bunch of different his- histories, words, and periods, um, it would become completely unlistenable so but but at the same time uh one of the reasons for wanting a a podcast to have sources is because when i as a as an as an instructor as as a professor ask my students to go out and look for good sources on the internet i always say do they cite any sources do they give you an indication of where their information comes from do they give you a reason to believe they're reliable if so then you know that's that's a good start and then you can evaluate the the work so if I say that to my students, then <laughs> I better have at least a few sources in my own podcast or else I'm already breaking that rule. Um, and so trying to, to, to balance that, I think, is really hard. Um, now, there's a discussion um, in the, pod, in the uh, chat and I, from, some, uh, from Jennifer. So I'm actually going to turn to that now. We'll come back to some other questions, but just I think this is can I, addressing. Can I just oh, add, yeah, add one more uh, thing to that previous discussion is that I sort of come come to it from two sides because not only do I create a podcast, but I do use other people's podcasts as course material. 
Um, and, you know, the, what the purpose of having citations to use it in, um, in course material is, I suppose, mainly a question of modeling good practice. Um, you know, as you say, how, how do you know a source is reliable? When I'm teaching um, undergrads and, and using podcasts as, as course material, they're not going to really sort of backtrack any of the citations, most likely, unless there's one particular point that gets mentioned somewhere that they want to use in their final project or something. And then they may, you know, want to be able to sort of plunder someone else's um, bibliography uh, to find other good sources on the topic. Um, but for the most part, I think with at least with undergraduate students, it's a question of, you know, as I say, modeling that that kind of um, best practice um, and, you know, knowing what is reliable information on the Internet and what isn't. Yeah, I think I think that's a, a good point. Um, sorry, Tala, go ahead. Uh, if, if I may, I'm, I think if, I think it's important to distinguish between the, the types of podcasts that are being created in terms of how a podcast is cited. Um, because there's some which are like an extension of the secondary source, right? Like it's an article that Donna seems to be doing, if I've understood correctly, seems to be a creation of a primary source, right? So, so that that is gonna be, because if she's recording oral histories of people, that, that might, that's easily gonna be cited in like a, a dissertation or something. And so, again, I, how that's done, one has to be sort of standard, has to be come up, you know, has to be devised to, to make sure it's reliable. Yeah, I think that's a very good point. And um, so, actually, uh, let me piggyback on that from um, Jennifer in the chat has says, um, mentioned that there's been a conversation about archiving podcasts for a few years now. Um, there's a radio preservation task, for, task force that has, of course, been thinking about audio preservation uh, for a long time. And they work with the Library of Congress. And Jennifer points out that would be a great organization for the Humanities Network to partner with. And it's true. Um, I do keep hearing a conversation about a sort of ways of archiving uh, podcasts and that concern. Uh, and then it always falls off my list of things to think about because there's always so many things to think about but maybe this is a good place you know for us to uh bring that up as something that should be done um and there's a couple of names given and then jennifer uh, you're welcome to uh speak for yourself if you'd like um i this this uh, model that you mentioned of cocaine and rhinestones if you want to bring tell us about that there's a there's a country music podcast, a history podcast that is written by I forget his his first name, but it, um, his last name is Co. He's the son of David Allen Co, the country singer. And what he does in his podcast, it's very deeply historical, and he gives it all as kind of a, a performance in a podcast. And then he says like, okay, that's the end of the show. If you don't want to stay for the show notes, you can take off. And then he has about 10 to 15 minutes of spoken show notes at the end of the show <laughs> where he actually goes through and talks through his sources and picks them up and says, hey, like I found this book. It's the only one I could find. Why isn't there more written on this? I use this source to do X. This biography was not very reliable. It was written by the person and they're obviously putting this perspective, but I had to take this from it. And he actually talks his way through the sources for the last 10 minutes. And I find it really interesting and engaging because it's like a, a research mm -hmm. lesson on mm -hmm. top of citation, on top of how he books. Um, but I, but it, he gives a clear point where if you're just the listener who's interested for country stuff, you don't, you trust him, you don't really need to go the next step, you can leave. Um, and then he also posts a show notes, sometimes even gives away his sources to listeners when he's finished with them. So I've really enjoyed that model and, and thinking about asking my students for their, to do that for their podcast this semester and see how it goes. And maybe even for papers for grad school, you know, I want to know how they're using those sources. Well, it's basically taking the methodology section or, you know, in a way, right, mm -hmm. the historiography section from your, your paper, your dissertation or whatever, and sticking it in as a podcast. Sorry, Donna? Oh, I was just going to say that's super interesting. I haven't heard of that strategy before, but I think it touches on kind of this tension that we're um 
highlighting, which is that the audience for these podcasts is so varied, or it can be so varied. And I think one of the things that draws a lot of people to podcast, academic or scholarly podcasts is that they can reach wider audiences, but the expectations of that audience are different. Um, and we talked, I forget who it was that mentioned that, you know, it wouldn't be pleasurable to hear um, you know, someone citing something constantly, that's just not what the audience expects when they listen to it. Whereas when we write an academic article, there are form, it's a genre um, mm-hmm. that we follow. And it's interesting that, I mean, I'm, this is totally anecdotal, but I don't think conversations of pleasure or enjoyment really come up much when we're talking about <laughs> writing <Academic> traditional writing? <laughs> academic articles. <laughs> I mean, yeah. not that you can't be creative and, um, mm-hmm. you know, enjoy a good read, but it's, it's different. Mm -hmm. Um, so I'm not sure if I have any kind of answers around that, but I'm just, I'm seeing this tension that we're, we're highlighting. Yeah. Nobody says, well, well, it it, it is actually interesting. My students do say when I give them scholarly articles to read that they're very thrown by the, you know, the ones that have more, more footnote than they have, uh, you know, the ones with discursive footnotes rather than citational footnotes are really thrown off. And I keep wanting to sort of say, oh, oh, you don't, you don't have to read those. <laughs> like, I mean, you, I, but I don't want, I, I don't want to be on record as saying that because that sounds like unscholarly of me, but you know, when I give a, 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 art, a scholarly article to my undergrads, um, it doesn't matter whether they know whether it's from Pausanias's, uh, you know, <laughs> writing or from Herodotus's writing in the footnotes. No, it's okay. Just read the, the basic story. And they actually, so there is a, an element of enjoyment in a sense of, uh, that they get stressed by the footnotes and they find that difficult. Uh, not that I'm saying we should leave them out, but that kind of does show uh, that even in that written genre, if you're not familiar with it, 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 it can be a problem. And it takes practice too, to, yeah. to read through an academic article. It, you know, we teach skills on how to, how to read through it. And mm-hmm. um, it doesn't, Music, I don't yeah. think, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I guess that is the advantage of that spoken, um, uh, show notes section because you know he says you can stop you can press stop now you don't need to to you know uh, listen to this if you don't want to so it's there for for people who want it but uh, it doesn't have to interfere with the enjoyment of of the podcast to the casual listener so I like that can idea oh. go ahead Tala go so I have no interrupting to, to no go ahead okay. Um, I was going to say, um, I think, I think there's also the issue of, um, so, so the medium's the message, right? And so I was, that's probably spoken about in, in, in some of the other, um, sessions. Um, I mean, fundamentally, I think a podcast of some more entertainment than education. I might be wrong with other people might feel differently about that. And so you should just listen through one time through, okay? Like like music, you don't really go 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 back to you, you listen. To, and I think this has been spoken about in other sessions. Most people listen to podcasts while they're like doing their washing up or driving mm-hmm. or whatever, right? So it's a casual listen, right? Um, and so those kind of oral histories, uh, which are being recorded, you can listen to them as just oh that's interesting that happened fifty years ago in this town. Right. On the other hand, a serious researcher would need to sort of um, go through it a little bit more methodically, right? Uh, A transcript could help, but then also there's the issue of tone as well, right? That's the Mm -hmm. other important thing of like, like when you're at court, you have to see the person as part of the experience of 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 having the witness there, right? How how they behave as much as the words on the page, right? in terms of what's communicated to a jury so um i mean i don't know how how i, mean, I guess those are some other it might not mind with citation issues per se but um like recording people's tone and whatever mm-hmm. but those, those are just some sort of random thoughts i'm happy i'm having at this time of the day <laughs> Yeah, and I, I think, that, you know, in terms of getting back to the idea of preservation, um, I think it's important that both the audio and the trans, transcript are preserved uh, and preserved together because you're going to get different information out of each of those elements. Um, 
And but of course, this is this is a big problem in any kind of um, you know future proofing of uh, online media. Um, I guess in some ways, podcasts are a little bit more insulated from from that because there isn't it, it isn't relying on one platform. Um, you know, it's sort of distributed. But with something like YouTube videos, um, you know, it's one company. Uh, and if that one company disappears, that entire record of uh, material is just gone. Uh, mm -hmm. And there's no way to recover that. Um, <laughs> yeah, the existential angst of that is, uh, it comes up every so often in yeah. the YouTube community of like, I do know that tomorrow morning I could wake up mm -hmm. and this entire, all my life's work would be gone. <laughs> It but of course, it's it's not uncommon for a for uh, a podcaster to change their podcast feed midway through, right? To to go with a different um, a, a different server or whatever. And as soon as you you do that, you break all of those links. Um, so you know if you you know if someone has cited your podcast, how do they you know do they have to continually update uh, the mm -hmm. reference? There's no, as far as I know, there's no standard way of um, you know, citing a podcast that is platform independent. One of the things that, that I recommend and something that we'll be doing with our podcast is uploading it to an institutional repository. If you have one at your university, um, uh, we are able to upload our podcast with the transcript and a DOI, which is a persistent identifier, is automatically created. So I think it was Tala was saying earlier about, you know, what happens when the, the link dies or, um, you know, if you move platforms, well, it, citing with a DOI can kind of help with, uh, with that. Um, and it also makes your podcast a little bit more easy to find. And, and I think one of your questions was, you know, how do we make our own podcasts uh, to be citable by others? And I think one of the ways is to just make it easy to find. And I mean, RSS feeds obviously help. Um, but I think another component of that is, you know, putting it in a place where it's less likely to um, to disappear, or like you said, you know, if YouTube disappears and all you have is your copies on there, um, we like to say, and uh, there's actually a, a methodology of keeping lots of copies of things. We, we, as librarians, that's something we try to practice. So even if you have your podcast, you know, running through um, a feed, making sure you download, um, download it and uh, store it on a, you know, even a separate hard drive. Um, as a starting place, but definitely encouraging folks to use something like an institutional uh, repository. And then making sure when you do upload it that your metadata, so all the information that you have to describe your podcast is detailed and thorough. Um, and if you are with an institution and that's something that's maybe a new process for you or you're not sure, you know, I always say ask a librarian because that's something we do <laughs> quite regularly. So I would definitely uh, reach out to them um, to see how they can help in that regard. Um, one of the other benefits to uploading it to our institutional repository is that it gets added to our library catalog. So when students or researchers are searching on topics, the podcast will appear um, in the database. Um, so yeah, just because I know this this conversation of preservation comes up quite a lot, and that's usually the where I kind of point people in the direction of. That's a really good uh, suggestion, and I think I've, I've added it to the document. Um, Daniel asks um, if you upload to an institutional space for archival reasons, and then you leave that university. Do they keep that IP? Um, yeah, that's a great question. So for our institutional repository, you maintain uh, the copyright. Um, we, it is an open access repository, so there's different um, types of licenses that you would have to apply, but you could apply a, a no derivatives if you didn't want someone, you know, chopping up your podcast and, and making something new. Um, so it would still stay in that repository and you would always maintain the copyright of it. But of course, you might want to look into it at your own institution just to make sure. Can I add something? Please. Um, two, two things have come to mind. Um, one regarding um, preservation, one regarding citation practice. With regards to um, preservation, um, at least in the UK, the, the, you have the British Library and by law, um, any book that's published, they have to send a copy to the British Library to, um, to, to archive it for, for generations. I'm, I'm assuming there's something like that in the US 
US as well, like even bigger than the individual institution um, where someone could um, archive their own podcast that, that they're making or a researcher could archive um, or at least sort of place the podcast they're researching to just so they get a stable um, link that can be referred to in the future. Um, with regards to citation practice, a thought just occurred to me. If you're a researcher using podcasts as sources, right? Um, do you have to make your own transcripts to ensure that you're still using it as a you're still using that podcast as a primary source? Or can you cite the transcript made by the, the original podcaster? Or is that cheating? Is that like when undergraduates cite primary sources from secondary sources without actually looking up the primary sources? Well, that is a good question. And, um, you know, because I'm, I work with the ancient world, I'm totally used to citing primary sources through secondary sources. I'm like, yeah, it's a primary source, even if it's a Penguin Classics translation of the thing from the <laughs> 1982, it's close enough to primary for an undergraduate's purpose. So I don't know what's working, but, uh, but you're right. Um, so I don't actually have an answer to that, but I think, I think it is interesting, like is the podcast produced transcript um, a, a, good, a good enough source? to call it. Um, I think the, the other thing that occurred to me when you were asked, talking about that, um, Donna, is like we talked, and Mark, you were saying, they're distributed on all these platforms, right? People, and I actually have this problem when I'm even giving a link to a podcast for students to listen to, uh, which link do I use? Do I use an app? Like, cause most of them are proprietary or, or platform specific links. Now, most podcasts have their own website. And so I, as far as much as I'm, can I cite, I uh, use the link that goes to their podcast page, you know, the page for that episode and most, but I've had, there are podcasts out there that don't have that. They, the only thing I can find is the iTunes listing. And I tend to go with the Apple podcast list because I feel like it's still the most sort of widespread centralized one, even if most people, not everyone listens on Apple. But, um, you know, if I was citing it in a, in a article, which of those many links counts as the appropriate one to cite? Uh, you know, they don't all, all have the show notes on them, right? They don't all link, tell you immediately who the host's names are or, you know, things like that. So um, again, I think this, this brings up the, pra the best practices from a podcaster point of view, which is, you know, a reason to have a website and a reason to have a website with an about that gives all the information you're willing to make public on the internet. Another frustration I have frequently is for podcasts that are done by perfectly, like I don't care what your credentials are, but by people who are doing a good job and I like their podcast and I think it's a good podcast that's well researched, but their about page has like their first name and no other information. And I feel like a bit of a fraud giving that to my students and saying, yeah, like just trust me that I've listened to it and it's a good podcast, but there's no information about it on, you know, on the website, but trust, you know, trust me rather than them, I guess. So like, I would definitely say best practice. I think, you know, most academic podcasters probably do that as a matter of course, um, and you know, don't mind it. But I think that that's a, a thing to think about as a podcaster. Again, how do I make, it's not about credentializing, but how do I make it clear who's, who's associated, what, you know, what information people will have to need, know in order to be able to look at this in the future? Yeah, and I think that goes back to kind of the first question you you asked. Um, and if you just take a look at some of the citation style guides like APA MLA and look to see what is required to cite a podcast, things like last name, first name, episode numbers, um, you know, any URL, making sure that you have all of those visible so that people can easily uh, cite your source, especially students who, you know, uh, have to have, you know, a number of sources and be able to cite them uh, to these specific citation styles, so. Yeah, I, yeah, I think that's a, a very good, you know, just look at the, what the basic information people are gonna need and make sure that's in either your meta metadata or your on your show notes and, and just make sure it's always available pretty easily if you can um, and link it to it. Um, we've brought up transcripts multiple times. I do think that that's an important part of citational practice 
Um, for instance, one way you can use a transcript is adding in citations in your transcript that aren't spoken, right? Your transcript doesn't have to be a faithful transcription of every single sound you utter on your podcast, um, though that brings up Tala's point about <laughs> does it then become not a primary source but a, a secondary source? But anyway, um, I do think from a pragmatic point of view, that is a place if you want to put in more specific citations and be like, this section was from this book and this section was from the book, you can put that directly into a transcript. Um, and I will just say as a plug, because I don't know that I've, I haven't heard it come up that much in any of the other conversations, uh, I, like transcripts are really important people, <laughs> but they're also really hard. And I do wanna, you know, I think when this comes to that tension, we've already addressed it a bit, it's difficult to do full citations for a bunch of reasons sometimes. It's also difficult to do good transcripts. Uh, it costs money and time. Uh, I totally feel you, Tala, on the uh, trans, you know, automatic transcription does fine with English, but really falls down when it's not an English word. We, we have Proto-Indo-European roots and Old English and Latin and Greek in ours all the time. And boy, does our transcription software have <laughs> a rough time with that. Um, so I have to do a fair amount of editing of those the transcripts and that takes a lot of time. And we, we didn't have transcripts for the first 55 or 60 episodes of our podcast. It just seemed too hard. And now we've found some software that's decent and I use um, that it doesn't cost very much and cuts down the time reasonably and well. Um, and so now I do produce them, but it has added an immense amount of time. I think it's worth doing, but like, I don't hold it against independent podcasters who don't have transcripts. I mean, I'd like them to, but I understand if they don't because it's very difficult. Um, Jennifer brings up the point about grant funds. I think that is one of the ways if you can get, if you have access to applying for grants, that is one of the, that or, and or paying a student to do transcripts. Um, because grants always like it if you pay students and or involve them in, in the process. Um, I've, I used my professional account while I was, I'm no longer fully employed, but when I was, I used it for doing transcripts for my pod, for podcast episodes, because I claimed my podcast as scholarship on my CV and on my annual report and my department and university were good with that. So if that was scholarship, then producing transcripts for it was also scholarship. And so for a while I was using part of my professional account, um, especially in these last two years when I could not travel for conferences and I suddenly had money I couldn't spend. Um, and that was great because it got good work. The, those transcripts are the nicest transcripts I have. But I mean, you know, each of our shows cost 200, $250 to do a, a, a full transcription of because they were like an hour and a half long and I was paying a good rate for students. I don't know that I would have paid as much if I didn't use my professional account because, um, but you know, I was trying to do that. So like that's way more than most people can spend on, on their show. They have to do it themselves. Um, we have 10 minutes to go. Are there more? I would like to make sure that if there are questions from the audience, um, if, if there's any or any of just comments or responses to anything that's been said so far, um, please either, Put it in the chat or just unmute and and go ahead and and, and take part in the conversation because I, I i'm very interested if other people have concerns that we haven't touched on or responses to what we've been talking about i'm gonna do with what i do with my students in classes i'm gonna give be silent for a moment force you awkwardly to think about a question <laughs> Go ahead, uh, or if our panelists have anything else they'd like to say, of course. Um, I just want to go back to thinking about um, tr transcripts, because obviously reading is a lot easier than, than listening. I mean, something like an hour to listen, you can read in about 10 minutes, okay? Or you, at least you can skim read it as well. But um, Yeah, I think I think this issue of transcripts requires um, a lot of thinking because not just for citations, but just in terms of um, the purpose of a podcast. Um, because if it can be read, then then 
what what's the audio experience all about? But that's that's for another time, a conversation for another time. Well, yeah. yeah and so, like to, so go ahead. I was going to say one thing I I would love to see, and I don't know that it's technically possible, but um, if you can create URLs with a timestamp embedded in it, um, so that you can jump randomly to various points in an in an audio file you could put those links in the transcript so that you skim through the transcript to find the bit that you're in, interested in and then be able to immediately jump to the audio from that. That would get around that, that sort of problem. You can use the transcript for the benefit that it has, but then if you want to hear the, all the stuff that you know, can't be um, transcribed in, in, in the written word, if you want to hear the tone and, and, and so forth, you can easily access that rather than having to meticulously scroll through an hour long podcast trying to find stuff. Uh, Podscribe actually does that. You, so if you go to the transcribe, you can click on the word and it will jump immediately jump. to the audio. Oh, that's perfect. And that's, re that's really cool. It's, I, I, I think only problem is, is that um, unedited trans transcripts look the thing about editing, as 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 uh, Avon brought up, is it's 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 something. I mean, I have a feeling ten years time these things are going to get really sophisticated, and there'll be even less editing re required. But um, yeah, that thing ex exists pod with a uh, Podscribe. It might exist for other services as well, but it definitely exists for the one we're using. That's great. Uh, Dan, did you want to join in? Oh, I think I th I think we just kind of cover what what we just have like the um, that yeah like being able to click to the the area where you know something might be you know really interesting that or to quote or or anything, um, but also the transcript part is is really you know the time that it takes to do that. I mean, we our podcast is like a free flowing conversation. We don't have a transcript because we're funding the entire thing ourselves even being part of an institution our institution at usc said that any money that like the money if they provided any funds they literally would in a way the ip that would come from that it would be kind of usc's and so like i don't feel comfortable being like well i want my ip just in case anything happens so like there are all these like interesting things that are going on when it comes to like archiving a podcast or creating a or getting the funds to get a transcript or even hire a student um, because then it's then it's part of the university and and so on and so forth um so it's like is there a way to then go well these are audio um audio experiences and they're digital and then maybe it's not the podcast that maybe the citation part has to change as much as the scholarly part maybe the idea of like what happens when we think of projects, scholastic projects that are multimodal, where I can provide very embedded links inside the projects where it's just like, instead of having to describe even a video link, I can just go, here it is, click here, boom. And then it happens inside the project. So it's like, are there ways where these things kind of merge? No? <laughs> oh. <laughs> no, 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 no. I, I meant the idea of that is just so overwhelming that I, I can't. In, 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 uh, the idea of a project which is which is like automated and has all the links and is like as you just said multimodal it seems like it's, it's, it's just it's making my it's blowing my mind <laughs> well i mean it's like you take like the normal like blog style of like a medium article and then blow it up to a scholastic piece it's like i can like zero in on an area in a video that I want just played and I can embed the YouTube square right in the middle of my project, that being the piece and then just contextualize it inside what I'm doing so that it's just like seamless. Like maybe there's a way where the two worlds have to kind of come together and be like, this is what we have to do, you know, instead of like one coming to the other. Yeah. That question about the IP is a really important one and one that like, that is such bad practice from the university to I, the idea that they would claim the IP because they're giving you funds for it is, I mean, that if you get research funds for doing research for an article, is it copyright the university? I mean, I know that that sometimes happens, but anyway, uh, I can't rant about it, but Jennifer seems to have the same problem too. Uh, let me just make a couple quick points before we'll have to wrap up, but um, one about transcripts 
uh, it is such a frustrating problem how much they cost. And I 100% understand that. And especially if you can't get money from university because they're gonna be dumb about it. Uh, it is unfortunately also a very important accessibility issue because of course a sound only then uh, you know, becomes very difficult, not only for people who have no hearing, but for people who have difficulty with auditory processing. So for instance, if you want your podcast to be used in a university setting, I'm not allowed to give my students a podcast without a transcript as required reading. I can do it as supplementary material, that's fine. But if it's required reading, it has to have a transcript because otherwise I'm, I'm not meeting uh, our responsibility towards for accessibility for my students. So from the same, that was the reason we did our first transcripts we ever did was because we did a few episodes we really wanted to be useful for classroom use. So I knew they had to have good, not just sort of semi transcripts but like good transcripts so that they could be used. Um, and that's an unfortunate Pro, you know, point. Um, the other thing I will just say is that that's also a good reason to do crowdfunding because, which is not, you know, very academic, but is something that I think one should think about putting out a call and saying, I'm starting a Patreon or whatever for my, for my podcast specifically so I can pay to get transcripts made. It's something I have fairly frequently heard of people do. And I think it is useful for people to feel like they are contributing a particularly, you know, concrete reason for helping. So I'm not saying that it necessarily will cover the costs, unfortunately, but it is something to think about that it might be a way of um, incentivizing some support from your listeners because it is a very specific and helpful thing. So I'll just put those two together. Um, Daniel, you're quite right. Uh, issues of accessibility are, you know, all over the place, but the specific requirements that are in legislation are really what's driving this. Um, you know, and there is there are requirements for students to have access to large print versions of books. And, you know, there are, in fact, processes through my disability, you know, the people accessibility at universities for um, screen readers and things like that, where, in fact, you can turn audio, uh, sorry, visual stuff into audio. That is, they are supposed to be able to access that through the university too. Um, so, you know, in that sense, there is. Um, now, I don't want to keep anyone past the hour because <laughs> we've been given an hour and there's something else for everyone to go to. So I just want to stop uh, with, with uh, saying thank you very much to the members of the panel, to Donna and Mark and Tala, to everybody who's been involved in the conversation. I'm going to um, give you one more time that link. Um, to the uh, document so that it's useful for you later if you want it and do feel free to add your information there. Uh, as I said, if anyone wants to be able to get in touch with everyone else, thank you very much to Jennifer in particular for contributing so much. And I hope you are able to go to the next couple of sessions and uh, thank you all. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks everyone. Thank you everyone. That was so great. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, guys.